Welcome to the Providence College Podcast. Today, we are pleased to present the keynote address from the college's Friday, January 24th, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Convocation. This year's speaker was Nadaba Mandela, the founder of the Africa Rising Foundation and the grandson of Nelson Mandela. Mr. Mandela spoke to a group of students, faculty members, and staff members at the convocation, the largest community event of a week celebrating the life and legacy of Martin Luther King. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to thank good God Almighty for this beautiful day and for allowing us to all be here today, and may we all travel back home safely. Oh, you didn't get that. Oh, sorry, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. <laughs> I'm just messing, I'm just messing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start off by two short excerpts from that famous speech by Martin Luther King. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a sad case that we find here in America today. And I'd like to read one more from a revolutionary leader. They have come to realize that their freedom is extricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And we, as we walk, must pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not a revolutionary, but I would like to share my story with you today. I was born in 1982 in Johannesburg, Soweto, during the time when the apartheid government was at the helm of our society. A system so brutal, in fact, that if they found out a child had been born from a mixed-race couple, they would remove that child from both parents and put that child in a separate area of only mixed-race people. Now, I, fortunately for me, was sheltered from these experiences. And growing up with my grandmother in Eastern Cape, in a rural area known as Tofimvab. Now, I remember one day my parents told me that we're going to visit your grandfather in jail. And so as an eight-year-old, I had a typical image of what jail was like. Concrete bars, dogs, fences, guards everywhere. But when we got there, it was nothing like what I had imagined. When we got there, I saw a beautiful house a house much more beautiful than the one I lived in. There was a swimming pool. I never had a swimming pool. He had a chef. I didn't even know what a chef was. I met a chef for the very first time. We even watched The Never Ending Story. And we had great food, of course. And we met the man himself, tall, dark, handsome fellow. And he was so happy to meet us. Hi, how are you? What is your name? What grade are you in? What is your favorite subject? And so I didn't understand that they had removed Nelson Mandela from 
the famous Robben Island and put him in isolation in this house called Victor Veste because they were trying to break down his mentals to say, Nelson Mandela, you're an old man now. How about you spend the rest of your days with your children? And we will make sure that you live a comfortable life in a house such as this. But of course, Nelson Mandela never caved in, as we all know, because his freedom was very much linked to the freedom of those millions of South Africans. Now, ladies and gentlemen, after that amazing experience, that's when I knew what I wanted to do when I grew up. You know, most kids want to be doctors, lawyers, police. I told myself that day, when I grow up, I want to go to jail. <laughs> and so we left, and two weeks later, our grandfather came out of jail, and the whole world was in jubilation. Mothers, fathers, aunties, even the cats and dogs were celebrating in the streets. But that was only the beginning of the work that had to be done. You see, our country today is only 26 years old. This year would be our 26th year of freedom, of independence, of legitimate rule. People having voted and every man having universal franchise to represent themselves and their community. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I was very lucky. I remember I came to America 2000, 2001. And I was very excited. I went with my brothers, and we went to Disney World, of course. And I remember when the line in the queue trying to get in onto the roller coaster, and eventually we got to the front, and this gentleman helping you get onto the roller coaster, saying, take off your hat, take off your shunt glasses, you know, you're going to lose them on the ride. And uh, fine, and he said, where are you guys from? I said, I'm from South Africa. He says, wow, amazing. How big do the lions get? And I look at him, I said, what? I look at my cousin. I'm like, sorry, sir, I don't work at the zoo. I have no idea how big the lions get. <laughs> and so we traveled to London. And again, we met people there in London. Hi, how are you? Hey, where are you from? South Africa, South Africa. Oh, my gosh. What a beautiful country. But I heard it's so violent. I need 10 bodyguards to come there. I said, sir, uh, my grandfather's a president. I don't have a single bodyguard. I think you'll be just fine. And that's when I started to realize that people outside the continent of Africa have very little knowledge on Africa. And the little information that they have is what is perpetuated on the media that Africa is a place of war, poverty, disease, and dictators. And the only positive thing is going on a safari, seeing the animals, not the people, but the wild animals. And I realized that we had to do something to change this mixed conception that people have on our continent. And so at the time, I was working at a bank, and I called all eight black people that were working at the bank at the time. And I told them about this feeling that I had. And you know what? They had the very same feeling. That we need to change the image of Africa. That you need to empower our young people to be at the forefront of Africa's development. So that when they meet travelers, and they travel themselves, they can speak about Africa with a heightened sense of pride and confidence. To say that I am an African, I know what it means to be an African, and I am proud of it. And that is how Africa Rising was born in 2010. An organization dedicated to making sure that the development that's taking place on the ground, the people are the ones to benefit not multinational corporations. And so this year, we are celebrating our 10 years anniversary, a decade. And we realize that after reaching a decade, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to, to transform, so to speak, to move on to the next era, the next decade. And so last year, we registered a new organization known as the Mandela Institute for Humanity. 
three main pillars. The first one being youth empowerment and leadership activation. In 2018, we celebrated 100 years of our grandfather's life and legacy. And so I thought to myself, how do we make sure that this legacy does not be forgotten? Wouldn't this world be a better place if we had 100 Mandela's? Or we had more Mandela's? So how do we work with young people to make sure they understand the leadership style and the values of Nelson Mandela? A man who believed and worked with humility, discipline, resilience, passion. How do we make sure that these young people can travel through the footsteps of Nelson Mandela from the village where he was born and grew up in Ulu in the Eastern Cape, where he learned. Now, many, many people don't know that we come from a royal family. And we are from the fourth house in the royal family because we, in South Africa, practice polygamy. Now, the first wife of the king, that is known as the great house. The second wife is known as the right-hand house. The third wife is known as the left-hand house. And we are from the fourth house known as the junior house. Now, we have a very specific role. And that is to mediate between the houses that are above us, because they're always fighting over the crown. And secondly, to be counselors to the king. So you see, Nelson Mandela did not fall from the sky and become this great negotiator and believer in peace and harmony. He grew up watching his own uncle being a mediator to the king. And so settled into that before he moved to Johannesburg. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have many issues in South Africa that we're tackling at the moment. And one of them is HIV AIDS. Everybody in our country has been infected or affected by HIV AIDS. We have a whole generation of child-headed households. I myself have been affected by HIV AIDS. In 2003, I lost my mother to HIV AIDS. In 2005, I lost my father to, loss to HIV and AIDS. And so our family got together to discuss what we we're going to tell the world of how my father had died. And so we gathered at home, and one of my cousins raised their hands and said, well, you know, HIV AIDS doesn't kill you. It kills your immune system, so you're unable to defend yourself against common cold and, 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 and infections. And my grandfather said, no, we shall not do that. We shall simply tell the world that my son was killed by HIV AIDS. And that's exactly what we did. We went out there in the garden, and we all stood behind my grandfather, and he read the statement. Now, you must understand, in 2005, many families were still suffering from the stigma of HIV AIDS, not able to disclose to their loved ones that they had been infected by HIV AIDS, and so people were dying in silence. Our people have not had the courage to be able to tackle this disease head on. And that is exactly what my grandfather was trying to do, was trying to tell the people that, ladies and gentlemen, this is a disease like any other disease. And so in 2009, when the UN, United Nations HIV AIDS came to ask me to become one of the ambassadors, it was a no-brainer. And we embarked on a campaign known as Zero Discrimination. And the whole idea was to use football as an analogy in fighting HIV AIDS to say, do not allow HIV AIDS to score a goal against you. Protect the goal, right? And our aim is to make sure that by 2030, there is zero discrimination towards people who are infected by HIV AIDS. There are zero new infections and there are zero deaths related 
to HIV AIDS. The target and the goal being zero. And so we traveled, or we started of course in South Africa 2010 with the World Cup, and then we went to Brazil 2014, and 2018 we were in Moscow for the World Cup. And I've been very lucky to have been involved in such campaigns because like I said, ladies and gentlemen, when you have a whole generation of child-headed households, what kind of a job is a 13-year-old going to look for to look after her 9-year-old brother to look after their 5-year-old, right? It's going to be an illegal job. These are the kinds of things that perpetuate the social ills of our society, right? You talk about trafficking, you talk about prostitution, all these things because of an epidemic known as HIV AIDS. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my duty, it is my obligation, it is my responsibility to make sure I communicate this to my children when they are of age. Right now they are too young for that conversation. But it is important that each and every single parent that is in this room communicates to their children about the things that matter, not only to them, but that are putting our young children at risk. Now we know that our young kids go out and have fun, right? We're talking about the MTV generation. What is this MTV generation? They like to go out, they like to pop bottles, they like to shake booties, right? And we're saying, okay, this is how you, you know, this, this is how you not describe yourself, but this is part of your, what's the word I'm looking for? Expression as young people in this new generation, right? Which is fine. But ladies and gentlemen, let it not just be an aimless thing that we do as young people. Let it be linked to achievement. Today we have three very special recipients of the MLK 2020 Vision Award. And can we please give them another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there is a quotation by Coretta Scott King. And she says, the struggle is a never ending process. Freedom is never really won. You have to earn it and win it in every generation. Now, our grandparents fought the good fight, a physical battle of slavery, of apartheid, of segregation. And they were able to break those chains, those physical chains. And now it is our turn to be in that seat, to see what are the isms and schisms that still exist today. Now, our fight is a lot more difficult because unlike our grandparents, they can tell who the enemy is. The enemy is the judge, the policeman, and what have you. But today, our enemy is no longer out there. Our enemy lies within ourselves. We talk about self-determination. Now, I am trying to encourage young people to dream and to dream big. I say, if your dreams don't scare you, you are not dreaming big enough. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important that we encourage our young people to dream and we give them the necessary tools and resources to empower themselves and their community. Now, as we move into this new era, it is a new decade, ladies and gentlemen, 2020. They call it 20 plenty, 20 many, right? So how are we going to create an environment of abundance? They make you believe that we live in a time of scarcity. No, I don't believe that. Because if you come to Africa, you will see that we are living in abundance. But they don't want you to travel to Africa. They make you scared. They say that crime is 
is, is, is just too much, right? And HIV AIDS epidemic, if somebody coughs on you, damn, you might get the HIV AIDS, right? Africa is where it's at, ladies and gentlemen. The Economic Outlook Express of 2009 tells us out of the top 10 growing economies in the world, seven of those are coming from the continent of Africa, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when you talk about fashion, you look at Hugo Boss, whether it's Louis Vuitton, whether it's low end, high end, it doesn't matter. They're all getting inspiration to design their garments from Africa, right? I'm talking about the most amazing beaches that you will ever see. I'm talking about Mauritius. I'm talking about Cape Verde, right? Where are my African people at? Where are my South Africans at? Where are we at, guys? I don't see you. I don't hear you. Are we here? Are we here? Okay. Okay. I see you. Ladies and gentlemen, Coretta Scott King reminds us, and she says, I believe that all people who believe in freedom, tolerance, and human rights have a responsibility to oppose bigotry and justice wherever its ugly head may rear itself. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot allow criminals to continue parading as leaders of our society. When are we going to say enough is enough? When are we going to take a stand? There are many bright voices out here in this very America of yours, but I don't hear their voices. We had a great president not so long ago. Where is he? I cannot hear his voice. How, lo how much longer are we going to stand in silence hoping for somebody else to come along? Ladies and gentlemen, the time is now. Think about the world you're going to be giving over to your children. What kind of world are they going to be inheriting? I don't want my kids to fight HIV AIDS. I don't want my kids to fight prejudice. I want my kids to find a new thing to fight. Whatever it may be, right? Let us make sure that, ladies and gentlemen, we kill prejudice. We kill bigotry. We kill HIV AIDS. We cannot sit in silence any longer, ladies and gentlemen. One of my grandfather's favorite quotes, he says, there is no keener revelation to a society's soul than in the way it treats its children. Now here we are, Providence, beautiful city. I mean, look at us, we are standing in a state-of-the-art gymnasium here. Huh? We've got uh, basketball rims that move uh, at the touch of a button. Eh? We've got computers that can hack computers in Russia. Eh? <laughs> Guys, I'm dealing with kids in my school, in my village, who can't even afford to buy a soccer ball. What kind of a world will our kids be inheriting from us, ladies and gentlemen? How much longer are we going to stay in silence? I ask you again. Today, I was very lucky. I met a young gentleman by the name of David O'Connor who took me around, and he took me to the national parks, and I got to learn of a gentleman by the name of Roger Williams. Roger Williams, I said, wow. Now that's a man. Now that's a man with a vision who spoke God's words. He was a messenger from God to tell us, separate the church from the state. We cannot continue living like this, ladies and gentlemen. And so now, I want us to salute these great men that have come before us, who have paved the way and who have shown us that it is up to us to determine our own future and create the environment in which we want our children to thrive in. Now, I'm going to teach you a salute. Are you ready? 
When I say viva, Nelson Mandela viva, you say viva. Are you with me? And when I say long live, the spirit of Martin Luther King long live, you say long live. Are you with me? Viva Nelson Mandela, viva! Viva! Viva Roger Williams, viva! Viva! Long live the spirit of Martin Luther King, long live! Long live live the spirit of Coretta Scott King, long live! live. I thank you. Thank you for listening to the Providence College Podcast. Episodes are available at all the usual places, along with the college's YouTube channel. For producer Chris Judge, I'm Joe Carr. Until next time.